Hey, look at that. You get, you get a view of my backyard for right now. I think uh, I got the, the link fixed, which is great because I got word that it was being cantankerous, but that's just, I'm sure my fault. Uh, we're going to get going here in just a second. I am glad to see those of you on here. Hello. Good evening. Hi, Jenny friend. And yeah, here we go. Uh, this is Word Workshop number four. Where to begin and why. Maybe that seems odd that we've done three and haven't really talked about where to begin uh, in reading your Bible, but I think, uh, well, I think I mentioned the first week that we're just going to kind of go with the flow of this and see how it, uh, see how we're led with that. So let me just make some quick adjustments with my camera and we will go forward. Okay. Now you're going to have to prepare yourself for not seeing the pretty backyard and just see me. There you go. Now, if the class behaves themselves, maybe we can look at the outside again, but we'll see. Okay, uh, let me pray, and I will begin our material uh, as we have in the previous weeks. I'm, my goal is to do like 15 minutes of instruction and then open it up for up to about 15 minutes of Q&A. An interaction if you have any thoughts about where to begin and why and struggles you've had in picking up your Bible and reading it um, or if questions of just kind of random interpretation questions or what to do about places that your Bible come up uh, we can we can talk about those too so let me pray and then we'll we'll jump in oh Lord thank you for your word Thank you uh, that we get to read it and that uh, you are gracious enough to give us your word in a language we can understand. What a demonstration of kindness and grace from you who transcend all things earthly and human. Uh, we are your creatures, Lord, and yet you so kindly choose to speak to us in a way in creature language, not in creator language. Um, and that's that's loving of you. I pray that you'd help us tonight to to soak in what we need to soak in, Lord, to grow in our uh, our confidence and our competence with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let me bring us back to um, why we're doing this. And I'm going to try something kind of new tonight. So this was the, this was the um, garden cam, but I'm going to try to do this with... Look at that. That's the Bible. So uh, our our verse that we've been working off of with the word workshop, in other words, why are we even doing this, is right here. 2 Timothy 3.16, which you can see, says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God or the woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. That's what we're here to do. Um, and anytime you may have questions about how to do that, um, I would love to have you shoot me a text or email so we can put that on the list for a word workshop. I will tell you next week, Lord willing, because we've kind of done every week and then a couple times every other week, um, my my next one that I'm I'm thinking of hitting is what do you do with prophecy, specifically the prophets? Uh, so prophets and prophecy, which don't always mean the same thing. So I think that's what we want to do next week. Uh, but let's let's just jump right into Word Workshop number four, where to begin and why. Uh, let's let me let me start with the, the wrong places to start. Well, that's that's too strong. Some of them are just wrong. Some of them are less effective. So the less effective places, the less effective starting lines for getting into the word. 
Um, for anyone who's just starting or has not been in the Bible for a while, and you know, you pick it up, and let's be honest, that's a thick book. That's lots and lots of really thin pages and a lot of words and numbers and stuff that are confusing. So where do you start? Here are some of the spots I would recommend don't start. Uh, from personal experience, from when I first became a Christian and got a Bible, don't start in Genesis. Why? I mean, it says in the beginning, at the beginning, that seems like a reasonable place to start. Uh, of course, you can start with Genesis. It's the Bible, and it's beautiful and amazing and really sets um, sets the history of redemption in, in context. It kind of I mean, it tells the history of redemption from the from the beginning, and it's beautiful. But if we don't have a firm grasp of the gospel or what what the whole biblical narrative and the whole redemptive narrative is about, we can get we can get in the weeds pretty quickly in Genesis. And there's a lot of strange things. I'm not even joking. As soon as you hit the Nephilim, you're going to be like, "Whoa, what? Who is this? And what's going on?" When the sons of God took the daughters of men and the Nephilim, who were the giants, were in the land. You know, that's when people start saying the Bible is completely irrelevant and weird. And why do we even read and listen to it? So Genesis, I wouldn't recommend a place to start. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, I would not recommend starting in the book of Revelation. It's equally confusing and strange if you don't have... Um, an understanding of apoc apocalyptic writing and what the what John the apostle and writer of Revelation was going after and how it's structured and all these things and if we don't have a sense of the centrality of uh, what really is this all about Revelation can become uh, quite a quagmire of guessing and predictions and fortune telling and all all kinds of weird stuff so. Uh, don't start in Genesis. Don't start in Revelation. Don't start with the prophets. Uh, I I love the prophets. It took me a long time to feel comfortable in them um, and and accept their poetic and and different language, especially and in the context of uh, Israelite history and where each falls and why some are some way. And so again, I, I just don't recommend that as a good starting place. Hey. I'm, ju I'm just about to open my Bible for the first time. What do you recommend? Totally jump into Obadiah. Shortest book in the Old Testament. Just go for it. Super short. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, there's beautiful stuff in Isaiah. Habakkuk is incredible. But I just don't think that's a great place to start. Number four place I would recommend not starting. Uh, commentaries. Really, really popular to think, oh, I should read a commentary so I understand what I'm reading. But I want to encourage you, don't start with a commentary because a commentary is always somebody's understanding of what the Bible says and means. And though it might be right, and I can turn you to a bunch of good ones, um, just start, start in the Bible and then go to a commentary. So number four, don't start with commentaries. Uh, don't start, number five, don't start with devotional books. I'm a big fan of those two. I think they're a really important voice into our lives. And more often than not, we tend to not listen to the best ones. The best ones, in my opinion, are written by guys who are really old or been dead a really long time. Most current, just hot off the press, hit the bookshelves of Christian bookstore, devotional books are anemic at best and uh, hardly, ugh, hardly palatable. Some of them, they just, they, they just, you know, anyway, don't start with those. Don't say, well, I'm going to read my Bible, but first I'm going to read the latest book by even a, a, a reputable author or, or a good person to read at some point. I just want to encourage you, don't start with them. And the, the last two are, are, I mean, it's we're going on a gradation of not such a bad idea and always a bad idea. Uh, number six, don't start with social media. I don't know what even that would look like, but I guess, you know, don't start with, well, what should I say? Uh, wh what are my friends saying? Uh, what, what, what is popular out there? Um, asking for opinions and what do you think it means when it says on social media? I, I just avoid any of those devices uh, and platforms. And number seven, the absolute worst place to start reading your Bible is nowhere. 
<laughs> Don't start reading your Bible by just starting nowhere and saying, I'm just not going to. See how that works? Okay. So what is a, where is a good place to start in the Bible? I got three steps. And, and honestly, I, I really do think these are helpful sequentially. So first step, number one. Then second step, do second step after first, or number two after number one, and number three, in that in that way. And again, this, this is not some sort of uh, you know mandate. I'm not telling you where you have to read. I'm just saying if this has been a struggle for you, and you're thinking where do I start, or I haven't read it for I haven't read my Bible for a long time, where do I how do I pick it back up again? Here's a here's a good starting order. Number one. Start with the Gospels, and I always recommend the Gospel of John as a starter. You don't have to do John. You could do Matthew, Mark, or Luke, of course, as well. John's just a great starter. Um, why? Why start with John, or why start with the Gospels in general? Well, because Jesus is a person who lived in history. He's from a real town. He's from a real family. He was he lived and ministered within a real culture and a real social, economic, religious, political context. That that was real. That happened, and the Gospels put us boom right in it. You know, right right in it. Uh, whichever one you started. You know, in fact, one of the great things about Luke in in chapter two, and Luke was a historian, so this was a big deal from him. For him, was like in in the year of this guy being governor of this area and this guy being proconsul and all these things. Just so you've got historical, socio political, religious context for this real life person. John doesn't start that way. John starts way more theological, theocentric, I would say as well. Um, and so it's a it's a great it's a great starting point. Why else? Well, why the Gospels? Um, because it provides us a lot of action or activity. We're we're watching the life of Jesus unfold. We're watching him from uh, from from birth through ministry, through rejection, through um, trial, through crucifixion, to resurrection, to ascension. We're we're watching all this take place. Without a lot, without a lot, now it's not exclusive, but without a lot of explanation, without a lot of editorial comments, we don't get much. Some we do. Uh, sometimes you're like, man, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Uh, but we oftentimes just get this movement forward. And that style of writing, that, that way of reading the text uh, is a great way to spark imagination. So you're in it, you're watching it, you're seeing it in your mind's eye. Uh, spark questions about, well, wonder what, why was this? How come that? What was he doing? Why did they respond that way? Why that person and not that person? Uh, and conversation. So it's really easy to talk about. And, and if you wanted to get together with somebody else and say, hey, I'm reading the book of John, it'd be great to have you join. It wouldn't be difficult to have conversation around that. Uh, okay. Uh, the stated purpose of John's gospel is found in uh, Chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And this is another reason why I think it's a great start. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he makes it really clear. Here's the purpose of writing my gospel. I want you to believe that Jesus is the Christ. Um, so great place to start. Then what? Number two Keep going to the right. Um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Acts. Acts is a great second step. Why is that? And it's probably listed in your Bible as the Acts of the Apostles. I think once you start reading it, you'll agree that it's really better titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit because he's really that he's the hero of the story. Um, so why is Acts a good next step? Because Acts, the book of Acts, shows us. I mean, it's it's really action oriented it shows us what happens when people do believe that jesus is the christ and have life in his name what happens to people when they when they really give themselves to this and believe it wholeheartedly what does jesus do what is the holy spirit how does he come and fill his people which john talks about and lead and teach in all things which john talks about and comfort his people which john talks about how does the holy spirit do all those things what's it look like when when the name of Jesus and the truth of Jesus and the and the work of Jesus really grips 
the heart of not just an individual, but a whole bunch of individuals who collectively make up this new people. Uh, it answers the question of how does general, general, I'm sorry, genuine belief in Jesus affect cultural engagement in real life? Uh, it shows in the book of Acts the relationship to one another as the church and to the world, both as our mission field and this oppositional force against the church, which is really, really beautiful and fascinating. Uh, but that's what that's what Acts shows the world to be. The world is the mission field of the church. Go and make disciples of all nations. And just know that the world is going to be against you in John. Jesus says, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. So don't be surprised uh, by that hatred. So that's what Acts shows us. So it's a great next step to move through. And then finally, third step, I would say, so Gospels, preferably John, or whichever you want, uh, the book of Acts, and then jump into one of one of Paul's epistles. Of course, you'll meet the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, and you'll trace his life as God grips him. But then I, I would recommend one of three epistles for your third read, and that is either Romans, Galatians, or Ephesians. Uh I'm not going to get into like the details of which, why Romans is obviously long. It's like 13. No, it's like 16 chapters. Uh, Galatians is shorter. Ephesians is a bit shorter. So why those? Because this is when we start hearing the, the, the apostolic teaching of the gospel, the implications of the gospel fleshed out for the churches. In other words, if John, if the book of John is the action movie, then Romans and Galatians and Ephesians and the others, of course, are, are kind of a director's cut with commentary. Oh, this is what that means. You know, when the veil tore in two, this, this is what that means and indicated. This is what it means when he said it's finished. This, you know, all these things that in the Gospels are like, wow, that's incredible. But we don't, we don't see the phrase, um, we don't see the phrase justified by faith alone. We don't see that in the Gospel of John or any of the Gospels. It comes up a lot in Romans and Galatians um, because that's wanting to, you know, flesh that stuff out. Uh, the epistles are a bit more prescriptive. Here's what you're to do. Um, and pedagogical, meaning it's kind of teaching. Here's the situation. Here's the teaching. So that we have a more sustainable understanding of what Jesus accomplished and is now doing and will do. So that that's my three-step suggestion for you gospels uh, maybe john and then uh acts and then romans galatians or ephesians um i also want to give you a, a a help in this let me turn my bible back and i'll get on bible cam here in a second and i want to i want to encourage you to utilize the footnotes and the cross references when you do this one of the one of the difficulties i think a lot of us face when reading our bible is this feeling of hurry um, that we get extra points if we read the whole thing in a year or we read a lot at one time um, or we just plow through it and you may have noticed that in, in a lot of Bibles um, unless you're just grabbing the, the ones that we have in the back of Sharpstein there's a lot of footnotes and margin notes and numbers and things that are a little confusing and I want to encourage you uh, to have a Bible that has those and then to utilize that, utilize the footnotes and cross-references. It is okay to go slowly through your Bible reading, and it's a great way to get familiar with the rest of Scripture. Um, and let me get my camera ready. See, here's my camera. Do -do 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 -do. You could really trip us out and turn it on, and it would just be like forever. Great way to get familiar with. Okay, so let me uh, let me see if I can get this on here. Okay, here we go. This is Ephesians chapter 1, and this passage, verses 3 through 10, actually the ongoing passage through verse 14, is absolutely incredible. But here's what I want us to see and utilize, because this will make for really good Bible familiarity. You can see how here it's got like these little letters, E and F and H, all those things pertain to this middle section. So we read, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What in the world? So there's that G, and that's in verse 3. So we come up here in verse 3. That's what that means. Chapter 1, verse 3. And we find the G 
and it says, oh, verse 20 or chapter 2, verse 6 or 3, and so it gives you a place you can turn, or it'll maybe like down here in verse, uh, verse 6, it'll say, oh, there's John or Colossians, or it'll reference an Old Testament passage, and you can use that to bounce around while you're reading and get really familiar with what it says in the rest of the scriptures without necessarily saying, oh, I, I got to know all that too. Just go look it up and see what it says and see how it compares. And I think that can be a, a really helpful way to mass familiarization and to see some, uh, see some context as well. All right. Well, that's what I got for where to begin and why. Begin with the Gospels, Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Holy Spirit, and then one of, one of those three epistles is a great way to start. Okay, uh, we got some time. If you have any questions, fire away, and we can. Uh, I'll try to address those as they come up, or we'll just conclude and be back next week. At least click on you and say "thinking" or "hi," so I can see that there's still a still a, it's still working. One of the difficulties of all this um, live stuff is I really have no idea if anybody's out there. It's like Matt Damon on Mars, just like that. Oh, there you go. Good question. Um, Asked, what are the two Bible versions or translations that you would recommend? Wow, this is a great one because um, there's a spectrum there's a spectrum of translations that go from like vernacular, uh, easy to understand to accuracy in, in a linguistic way. And, and so all of our translations are, are find themselves in that. Um, so you've got, and, as well as different ancient texts they come from. So the King James and the New King James are coming from um, n older texts, but not as many. And, uh, and some of the other, I'm sorry, not as old, but just uh, a, 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 a lot of text. That's what they are. Whereas the NIV, the ESV, the New American Standard are coming from the oldest ones. Thinking, well, if it's older, it's more accurate. So let me just answer your question. The two uh, Bible versions of translations that I would recommend, I would say definitely the ESV, the English Standard Version. And and I still am a fan of the NIV. I think those are two that that are, are good. Um there's a called a Christian standard version right now that I, I have a copy of and it's fine. Um, but I tend to stay away from um, some of the really um, paraphrased versions or the, the new century version or ones that are trying to make it so easy to understand that we lose, we lose the good stuff. Just lose the good stuff. Okay. So there's a couple that, that I think uh, another question uh, which Bible would you recommend for studying purposes? I think the ESV is a great start. And if you want to go more, more down the road of what's a, a more literal translation, the New American Standard is really wooden. I mean, it still has these and thous and stuff in the Old Testament. Um, and the grammar is, is more in line with how it was written in the Greek in the New Testament, which is not always easy to understand. So you kind of have to stumble through like, well, why do you say it that way? And they're just trying in that one to be a little more literal. So the ESV and the NASB are really good for, for like study words, word study type purposes. Oh yeah. Well, you got double duty then, didn't they? Okay. Uh, easy to get stuck on problematic concepts. The seven days of Genesis, the X, uh, X 238, AD 70 doctrine reading versus studying. Yes. Easy to get stuck on those things, and I would just recommend like there's a lot of things that are that um, if you're getting stuck on problematic concepts, kind of just back them up on the burner a little bit. Put them, not on the neglect burner, but don't put them so on the forefront, and maybe get to some concepts that aren't problematic first, um, and and then just work your way through those when you can. And if they're continuing to be really problematic, and just don't get them then some of them honestly are okay to not fret about like the seven days of creation. Yeah. There's a lot out there. Um, but you know, the three or four different ways to, to interpret it ought not affect the centrality of Christ's atoning work on the cross. And therefore there's, 
there's margin for um, for disagreement or unsettledness on some of those, and not hopefully not get not get too stuck. <clears throat> da -da -da. Now I'm going to look up Acts two thirty eight because I, I don't know what that what that is. Oh, repent and be baptized. Forgiveness of your sin. You will receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, there's a few things in there that people have gotten hung up on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Any other questions about where to start and why? Okay, well, let me conclude by just reiterating, I think, something I said maybe the first week, which was, you know, take take your Bible reading in uh, digestible chunks. So if you want to just plow through and read it, that's great. But if you do that, um, just know that you're going to miss a lot of a lot of topographical details if you fly over quickly. And that's fine because you may pick up more thematic details that you can see from a higher altitude in a big flyover. Um, but if you're starting the book of John, you know, just take one section at a time as they're laid out and, and just go through it that way. Uh, there's no bonus points for hurrying. Um, and we believe that all of scripture is breathed out by God in all of its smaller parts so that you can hear his voice and be encouraged by his spirit and grow in your confidence and competence in the word. Um, not just so that you're competent in the word, but you're equipped as Paul says, you're equipped for every good work. You know, you, um, you, you, you're, you're growing in that skill of walking with the Lord, um, and knowing his word and knowing his will and, and, uh, ministering his, his, his gospel. All right. Well, I will conclude then. If, if there's not anything else, we're we still got like I'm two and a half minutes on my timer. Um, but I think uh, I think that's all. Okay. Well, I sure appreciate you all being here, and I hope this is helpful. And again, next week I'm aiming at spending a 15 minutes talking about what to do with prophets and prophecy and how those are different and how we can approach them in a way that is not weird and uh, grow <laughs> grow in the grace of the gospel through those. Okay? All right. I love you guys a bunch. I hope to see you soon and maybe be in touch. Call me or text me if you got any further questions. See you later. <laughs>